Hey guys, I know many of you guys are working from home, myself included, and did you know that there is a work from home ETF now? Yes, exchange traded fund. Ah, you can invest in working from home. I'm like, my goodness, there are all sorts of weird things that come out from all these kind of financial guys. So yeah, today um, we're going to explore a little bit about this ETF and also share with you guys a little bit about why I think most of these quote-unquote hype ETFs, right, it's part of a hype, right? They tend to fail. Hey guys, I know you're expecting an ad, but yes, at this moment, I just want to thank you for supporting us and I hope that you can share this podcast with one other person today. At the same time, if you really enjoy what we are doing, head over to whichever platform you're consuming our podcast and drop us a review so that more people can get in touch with the financial coconut. Meanwhile, take care, stay healthy and keep learning. See ya! So good morning everyone, I welcome you to another day with The Financial Coconut. In our podcast, we're debunking financial myths, discovering best financial practices, discussing financial strategies that fits our unique life. You get it, ultimately empowering us to create a life we love while managing our finances well. And today, we're going to spend some time to talk about why hype ETFs tend to fail the hype. Okay, for all of you who didn't know that there is something like that, yes, check out the ticker WFH, Work From Home. And yeah, it is an ETF created by these guys at Direction. Wow, what a name. So like every other ETF, it is a composite, right, of different, different things. Compound product. So let's take a look. What are the top 10 holdings in uh, WFH, Work From Home ETF, right? It has like... Twilio, Insego, CrowdStrike, Zoom, Ping Identity, Plantronics, Okta, Amazon, Vongo, Palo Alto. Um, yeah, they make up about 35%. These are the top 10 holdings for WFH. And much like many other ETFs, you mostly get to see the top 10 holdings. And from the top 10 holdings, hmm, Aku only know like Okta, Amazon, Palo Alto, Twilio, Zoom. Uh, that's about it. I don't know all of them and the goal is not to give you a buy signal or sell signal or say whether this is a good ETF or not, right? But I'm going to use them as a part of this understanding of why hype ETFs tend to fail, right? And yeah, WFH is definitely born out of a hype because everyone is working from home. And, you know, uh, some of these fun house, they create a theme and they pick stocks based on a certain theme, right? And in this case, is a work from home theme. But before we go deeper, I just want you to uh, know that, you know, from March 2020, which is the bottom of the market when it when it crashed all the way to August 2020, which is about the time we are recording now, uh, these top 10 holdings on average uh, all gained about 100% already. All right, so they went up about 100%. Ta-da! Yeah. So that is, that is something for you to remember. Remember that, yeah, this is a base case. Later, we'll talk about these things. But I also want you to know that they are not the only hype ETF in the market. There have been many hype ETF like BOTS, you know, which is an ETF about robotics and AI. They're like a wheat ETF, like POT, right? Like marijuana. Huh? There was a period of time that it was a thing and they created a few other ETFs during that period of time. YOLO, MJ. Um, and just for you to know, YOLO and MJ are not doing very well. Huh? They, they all at least half their value at this point in time from where they first started. So you will see more and more of these kind of hype ETFs or theme ETFs, right? So they become a theme after they the hype fade out, right? But most of them, they start because of a hype, because of a certain search, because of a certain need uh, and a certain belief, you know, in the market and they create all these kind of products because of a need for it, right? And uh, I'm going to try to give you some reasons as to why they don't perform now. They usually fail the hype and yeah, without further ado, we'll just start. Number one, okay, the very, very important reason why they fail, why many of these hype ETFs fail, is that these ETFs tend to be late to the game. 
as the term suggests, hype. Okay, hype ETF. They are created because of a sudden surge, right? Because suddenly there was some reason, you know. Then uh, there's a huge demand for for these companies, and they, you know, the some of these institutional investors they cannot directly acquire stocks. They cannot cannot directly buy certain companies because of regulation. So then they were going to disturb these other fund managers to say, hey, how about you create some fund, uh, some ETF, and then uh, I will buy. Right, so to facilitate the demand, uh, essentially, right, for a certain trend, and in this case, this particular trend is uh, work from home, which means that most of this ETF are late to the game because you already have all the underlying stock prices fly off to the roof, and that's why these ETFs are even concerned about these stocks in the first place. Before that, they're like, mm, not too sure. You know, there's a certain theme, a certain hype. And let me just give you some example, right? From Zoom, right? Zoom went from $109 in March 2020 to $250 in June 2020. Okay, Zoom, everybody knows Zoom now, right? Although, uh, got some scandal, lah, huh? but never mind. So, so that's Zoom. Twilio went from $71 in March 2020 to $210 in June 2020. And you know when did the work from home ETF started? It has inception in June 25th, 2020. Which means that the fund bought these stocks at probably the peak of their prices at this point in time, okay? Um, further down, nobody knows whether all these uh, stocks will continue to perform like how they have performed, right? Because most of them went up by 100%, 150%, 200%, you know, pretty crazy. The underlying stocks in the ETFs you know, have already like flew off the roof before the ETF bought these stocks, which is why I think they're late to the game because they are buying at the peak of all these companies and then you go and buy the ETF. <laughs> right? So I'm not saying that you will definitely lose money buying ETFs at their hype, you know, but risk reward analysis says that if you buy something at a peak, right, then you know, chances of them continue peaking is a lot lower, lah, right? So the downward pressure to to go down is higher, lah, right? So in my view, I, I will avoid this kind of hypes. Because also because that when there is a hype, they usually price in a lot more, right? So valuations go off the roof. And yeah, the ETF always late, lah. They always buy because there's a hype, lah. So then you more late, lah, you buy the ETF. <laughs> Also, because I'm a cheapo, I always like to go where there's a bargain. Right? So I always go dig in the bargain. Like at this point in time, I'm digging through like the retail sector. I'm digging through the REITs market, you know, because there's a bargain, right? Everyone don't want it. So yeah, I tend to like to be a cheapo and go to bargain. Lah, right? So I don't like to join the hype in, in that sense. And, and that's my bias in this view. But yeah, objectively, I think a lot of them are, are late. Which brings me to point number two. That is that the fees of these ETFs are generally many times higher than index funds. Okay, in general, maybe four to six times higher. Yeah, some of these theme funds are, you know, are even crazier. Okay, but anyway, some of the hype funds, theme funds, essentially, um, I use them a bit interchangeably because after the hype die down, they become a theme. Lah. Okay, <laughs> but today we focus on hype. Okay, focus on hype. Huh? And some of these funds that we have talked about before, which is like bots, 0.69% um, expense ratio. YOLO, 0.74% expense ratio. Work from home, 0.45% expense ratio, right? So it doesn't sound very high, lah. sounds so so, uh, but if you compare it to the SPY, which is the S&P 500, right? I'm sure a lot of people know, the, uh, they are only charging a 0.095% expense ratio. So many decimal points, you're, you're not sensing it, right? But on average, okay, if you take 0.1% as the SPY's expense ratio, on average, all of them are charging about four to seven times more than SPY. It's okay. I know it's not easy to visualize this, but I will join you guys with a story, okay, after a word from our sponsor. Hey guys, times are a little cray cray now. I get it. Some of you guys may have committed to some form of endowment plans or saving plans, but are struggling to keep up with it. I just want you to know that this is understandable. We're humans. We do what we can. Times are a little different now. So if you're struggling and need some way out of it, whether is it policy financing or to surrender your policies at 10% above your surrender value, talk to Ethan and his team at The Policy Walk. Check them out at policywalk.com slash the financial coconut. Link is in the description below. 
Okay, okay, story time. Ah, we're gonna bring in our favorite character, Xiao Ming. <laughs> For, for all you non-Chinese people, Xiao Ming is this like character that we always use in uh, Chinese composition, right? Because you cannot think of any other people's name. Everybody writes Xiao Ming. Feng He really the Zhao Shang. Okay, but anyway, Xiao Ming invests $10,000 in bots. Okay, the Automation Robotics AI ETF. Okay, bots, B-O-T-Z. You can go and uh, search the ETF. All these are real tickers, uh, but Xiaoming is, uh, is kind of real. Uh, he, he, he's accompanied us through our childhood, but I honestly have not a single friend called Xiaoming. But anyway, so Xiaoming invests 10,000 in bots. And Xiao Hua, okay, Xiaoming's best friend, uh, always happen in our composition, uh, in invests 10,000 into SPY, which is the S&P 500 index. Okay, so the main thing we want to compare here is the expense ratio. That means the fees you're going to pay, right? So for bots, it's 0.68%. For SPY, it's 0.095%. Assuming 8% growth, that means both of them, whatever, whether it's bots or SPY, they grow at 8% per annum on average. Huh? In 10 years, okay, Xiaoming will have experienced a 110% profit Assuming, you know, grow lah, huh? assuming no big shit happens. Okay, and Xiaohua will experience a 113% growth, which is uh, essentially a 12% to 13% more profit than Xiaoming over 10 years. And this is why a lot of people always talk about the fees, the fees, the fees. Not all fees are the same, but in this case, when it comes to management fees that they charge year on year on your whole asset, right? It is very important. The lower you can go, the better it gets. Of course, it doesn't sound a lot, you know, on the get from the get go, right? Zero point zero nine five versus zero point five, right? And it's a point something, right? A small decimal point, nobody cares. But when you compound it over time, it becomes very significant. And if we can continue to compound it. For another 10 years, that means in 20 years, Xiaoming from that 10,000 that he invests in bots, assuming 8% annual growth rate, will get 306% at the end of 20 years okay, of profits. Right, and Xiaohua will get 357% right, at the end of 20 years profits, which means Xiaohua makes you know quite a bit more, lah, 50 over percent more profits in 20 years. And that is if they invest 10,000, right? What if they invest 50,000, 100,000, they compound, compound over time, it becomes extremely significant. You can pay down payment, you know, HDB. But anyway, the spat between Xiaoming and Xiaohua is not important. What is important is to understand that fees, when they compound over time, is very significant. And a lot of these hype ETFs, they tend to charge a lot more on average of about 0.5%. To 0.8% to 0.9%. I've even seen 1% kind of hype ETFs or theme ETFs. So definitely watch out on this kind of fees. Which is also why in my unit trust episode, I talk about why I don't buy unit trusts because more often than not, most of these unit trusts that you buy from your bankers or from your insurance agents or you know whatever platform that you buy from, uh, mostly these two platforms, they charge management fees, you know, ongoing two to three to four percent, and it eats into your profits like crazy, huh? more than Xiaoming and Xiaohua. Which is why when we bring back to the central idea of hype ETFs charging so much more relative to index funds, then they gotta perform better than index funds. But do they do that? That is, uh, you know, like a big question mark. Nobody really knows. Maybe, maybe they will perform better. But what you need to understand is because the fees are higher, they will need to perform better than the index funds to even make, you know, the profit on par with the index funds. And this brings us to my very last point, And that is that there's a very good chance uh, this hype ETF will vanish. And why? Because... You need to understand that you know uh, funds are also businesses, right? Fund house, they create a fund that is a product, right? And they need to sell this product. If they gather enough uh, buyers for this product, they can make a profitable product and they can continue to keep this going. But in the space of hype ETFs or in the space of theme ETFs, the success rate of these funds, um, it's relatively low. And I'm not even talking about them performing super amazing. I'm just talking about them like continue 
doing in business. So from the investment research firm Morningstar, Morningstar, nice name, you know, its latest report on global thematic funds suggests that only 45% of the funds, theme funds from 2010 is still around in 2020. I mean, it's close to half of these theme funds, they end up disappearing. And like I said, hype after hype become theme. Huh? So in other words, some of these funds that you supposedly subscribe to as a result of this hype may not even last 10 years. And in the case of funds, you know, from business perspective, when you look at a fund, right? When they set up a fund and it fails, there tend to be only a few reasons, right? And it all hinges on not enough money being gathered in the fund. And not enough money being gathered in the fund only has a few reasons. One is because it's too expensive, right? And someone else create another alternative or something. The other is that the fund is too unique that some of these big institutional, you know, or state funds cannot purchase, right? Maybe like your pension funds, you know, your... Uh, I'm not sure if CPF does this, but yeah, I know CPF mostly buy bonds, uh, which is by MAS, but anyway, uh, or your big institutional uh, investors, right? Like your insurance companies or your banks, they all have very tight regulation as to what kind of funds they can invest in. So if these big boys cannot put money in all these kind of, you know, theme funds or hype funds, then, you know, they got not enough, you know, customers lah. And fundamentally, it all hinges on the fund not performing. If something is performing for an extended period of time, um, I think people will look at it, lah, right? Because it's not performing, it doesn't fit their palette. And yeah, so good business. Lah. So if the fund vanishes, right? Uh, uh, five in 10 will vanish, right? In 10 years. Um, what, what happens for you? Other than potential losses, like we have established, right? Chances are they're not making money. That's why nobody want to invest with them. You know, other than potential losses, it's really about opportunity costs because you chose to put your money here. That means you didn't put your money elsewhere, right? And if something on this part of your portfolio, uh, something happened, right? Then it hinders your progress because you were, nobody planned for their portfolio to fail, right? Uh, of course, you know, that it's a whole long story on its own, but nobody kicks off their portfolio thinking that they want to fail, right? So if, if uh, your fund fails, you know, the hype fund fails, then, you know, essentially hinders your progress. Lah. And so that's it for today. I'm going to sum up the three reasons why hype ETFs tend to fail the hype. And number one is because these boys tend to be late to the game, right? They always buy after the hype has established and all the underlying stocks prices have gone up. Right, number two is that the fees are generally higher than index funds. On average, about four to eight times higher than index funds. What does that mean? It means that they got to perform better than the index funds to even ultimately perform aligned with the index fund, okay? And number three is that there is a very good chance that the fund will vanish, okay? Five in 10 vanish in the past 10 years. So I hope you learned something useful today. See ya! Hey, I hope you learned something useful today and truly appreciate that you took time off to better your life with the financial coconut. Knowledge is that much more powerful and interesting when shared, debated and discussed. I hope you would share what you've gained with people you love and I want to hear from you. Give me some questions and help me along with building a community of financially savvy coconuts. I hope together we can fulfill our curious minds and our desire for clarity. Join our community telegram group, reach out to us on Facebook and Instagram. Everything is in the description below and if you enjoy the podcast and feel you want to keep us going and stay independent, do buy us Kopi at Kofi.com. With that, have a great day ahead, stay tuned next week and always remember, personal finance can be chill, clear and sustainable for all. Okay, test, test. Um, I hope you learned something useful and yeah, it doesn't mean that you cannot buy Hype ETF. If you want to, uh, go ahead and just be more aware, more conscious that these are some of the realities that it is what it is. And for next week, we're going to spend some time rolling or, you know, on the ball of investing. I know a lot of you guys are asking for investing content, which is why we are working with you know, the fifth person to market their programs because we do think that, we honestly do think that their program is pretty good. Like we've really checked the back end and everything. And yeah, we, we thought if you really want to learn investing, you know, um, you can really consider, you know, paying a little bit for their program, right? Um, it definitely helps to keep the podcast going, also, right? Because we we do make we do make money from referral, but anyway, um, 
more importantly, next week. Okay, next week we're gonna um, talk a little bit about REITs. Right, I know it's a pretty popular. Um, tool these days and pretty popular topic a lot of people are asking about it so next week we're going to talk a little bit about REITs and I'm going to share with you three concepts you know that are not usually talked about you know um, to level up your REIT game right to understand better why REITs even exist you know what are their underlying factors and uh, essentially how do you become a better REIT investor right so those are um, the things that we're going to share with you next week so stay tuned next week and yeah see ya <laughs>